Okay, I'm going to start the webinar in a few minutes. Uh, I was going to wait for more people to sign in because we had uh, at least 20 or 30 people registered, but I don't want to make those that are here wait too long. So give me a second. Now, before we start the um, the actual webinar, I'm going to launch a, um, a couple polls, which are just some simple questions for me to get a sense of um, how I can best help those that are here. Your answers are not going to be published onto the screen for anybody to see it's just for me to know um, the results the total results sometimes are published but not your specific answer so here's the um, first question just so I know how you heard about this webinar if you could take a second please and feel free to put a note I guess into the chat pane which you should have on the right side of your screen if you're having any difficulty hearing me Okay, so uh, th and this is just helpful for me to know exactly um, what sources are the best way to notify people because we do these uh, webinars every month. So I'd like to know what's the best way to let people know of them. Moving to the second one. Do you have a case requiring a case information statement? Okay, so it looks like we're a little divided, which is good. Um, even those that don't have one um, would still hopefully benefit from the information, and then you may later um, need one. Okay, are you interested in a consultation to discuss this topic? Okay, so it looks like the majority don't know yet, which is good. Maybe you'll know better after this. Just feel free to either message me or email me at any time. Next two are about information that I offer to, um, to help people along with the process. The first is a New Jersey Divorce and Family Law Handbook. It's an ebook that I compiled. All right, so it's a little mixed. And again, if you, your answers for any reason change, just send me an email. Let me know if I can help you in any way with this. And then the last one is another ebook, but this is a little more specific topic that we offer for divorces regarding the financial impact. Let me know if you'd be interested in a copy of that. I know there's a couple of people that just signed in recently. We're doing just a couple of quick polls before we get into the information. And uh, feel free to send me a message in the chat box on the right of your screen if you're having any problems hearing me. Okay, it looks like a few people didn't answer the last one. Might be just those that signed on late. So I'm going to close this out so we can get into the information. Uh, again, if, the, if your options change, you decide that you want it after this or you decide you don't need it afterwards, just send me a message. It's easy to take care of. All right, so with that, we're going to jump into the materials. Give me a second just to switch the screens over, and we'll be right into it.
Okay, so welcome to the Micklin Law Group's seminar, Family Case Information Statements, Do's and Don'ts. Please send me a message now if you're either having trouble hearing me or if you're not seeing my screen. All right, so I'm not seeing any messages, so that's good. If that's a change, again, always use the pane, the message pane in the right of your screen so that I can uh, make any adjustments that we need. All right, so jump right into it. Today's webinar, again, it's the case information statements, do's and don'ts. I'm going to try to cover both what you need to put in what you don't need to put in, but also what you want to watch for with your adversary or the other party, both in whatever current litigation you have, as well as anything you may have in the future. The, uh, the webinar is intended to be 45 minutes. Sometimes it's a little less, sometimes it's a little more. I had a feeling when I was putting this together that this one could be one that runs a little bit longer because there is a lot of little places that I want to try to cover. I'm going to do my best to keep it to the 45 minutes. Um, but, you know, I think it's more important to get the information to you than to uh, limit it to its time. Um, I will be staying afterwards for questions. Um, if we go over or not, that's not really a concern that you need to have. I will still address everything. Uh, you, you probably noticed by now this is a one-way communication so that you can hear me, I can hear you, but you do have your message pane in the right where you can um, type in messages and you'll see there's a chat section and a question section. I would say I'd recommend using the question section for questions that you have so that it does not go to the whole group. Anything that you type into there will come just to me and not be displayed on the screen. As far as I know, I, that, that's my understanding. If, if it happens to be different, then just send me a message and I'll address it uh, specifically. Uh, we have a lot of people that have registered for this, only a handful so far have signed in. People tend to come in and out throughout the seminar or webinar, but it shouldn't really uh, interrupt the flow in any way. This is being recorded, so if there's information <clears throat> that's not clear that you miss, uh, let me know and I can send a copy of this to you afterwards. And then lastly, as I mentioned, I will be doing questions. Now, I normally do questions at the end of my webinars and I invite people to post the questions throughout so that nothing gets lost um, or forgotten until we get to the end. I'm going to try differently today, and I'm going to try to address questions throughout the, um, the webinar, because I think there might be a lot of specific information. It might just be better to address it when we're at that point in the webinar. So feel free to post your questions. I will be monitoring them, so I can do my best to answer it. Uh, again, if I don't get to them, I will stay as long as it takes afterwards to get to any questions that you may have. For those who don't know me, this is me. My name is Brad Micklin. I'm the managing member of the Micklin Law Group. I've been an attorney for a little shy of 20 years now. I am licensed to practice law in both New Jersey and Pennsylvania state bars, as well as the federal court third district. I started my law career at a law school working for a judge as a judicial law clerk. I worked for Judge Eugene Austin, who was the supervising judge of special civil litigation in Bergen County. Um, from there, I went into Kessler & Associates, which is a complex commercial litigation firm in Clifton. I did complex commercial litigation for a couple of years until I realized that I didn't really care much for representing businesses, and instead I wanted to have personal relationships with individual clients. So I opened my own practice in 2001 as a general practitioner and um, quickly focused my practice into divorce, family law, and estate planning and litigation. Uh, the Micklin Law Group was formed in 2010. I brought in a couple of associates, uh, a couple of paralegal and support staff, and some administrative staff workers. The purpose was to have a firm that, that can handle uh, complex issues with the resources necessary, but not to have to be part of a large firm where I lose the contact with my clients again. Um, the Micklin Law Group does focus solely in divorce, family law, and estate planning and litigation. My focus is more on the high conflict and high net worth cases, but I do handle the general gambit of the work that we have. 
All right, so what is a case information statement, or CIS, which is generally what we call it for? <clears throat> this is the, the basic document that sets forth all of your family's income, assets, debts, and expenses. The important thing to realize is that it's a certification under oath. So when you fill out the form and you sign in the back, it's just as if you're signing court papers. It's generally going to be required for any case that involves alimony, child support, equitable distribution, which is the division of assets and debts. Anytime you're asking or somebody's asking to have some of their legal fees or all of their legal fees paid and college contribution cases. There is an exception for child support where the parties were never married. That's uh, what we commonly refer to as an FD case, uh, F as in family, D as in David. Um, those are non-divorce support cases. There are form documents that the court has created just recently. Um, they're called summary financial statements. If you're unmarried and you have a child support matter, then you use this summary financial statement in lieu of the case information statement. Now there's an exception to the exception, um, and that's you know upon a showing of good cause. Like for instance, let's say you you have a child support case where the parties weren't married, but you have an individual who's self-employed. Child support is generally an income question. You plug both parties' incomes or both parents' incomes, and you get a child support calculation. When you're self-employed, income is much more complicated. Um, so the case information statement in a situation like that would be very helpful to not only both parties, but especially to the court. Okay, what is the purpose of the case information statement? <clears throat> and to me, if any of you here either have worked with me or will work with me in the future, my belief is that the case information statement is the single most important document that you're going to file in your case or in any case, whether it's a current case or a future case. Um, the main purpose is to provide the information that judges need to make informed decisions about the case or the issues before the court. So if you have a child support case, the information, the only way the judge, a judge can make an informed decision is by having a complete case information statement and all the information that is required by it, which we'll obviously talk about in a few minutes. The, it puts forth forward your basic and essential background information. It, it, it's not just an expense and income statement, but it will outline in the beginning the history of the case, both the facts as far as the dates of certain events like marriages, divorces, separation, child birth dates, um, but also the history of the lifestyle, which again, we'll, we'll cover in greater depth as we go forward. But it also provides insight for settlement terms. Uh, very often, you'll have cases that are returning to court at some point in the future to modify a support obligation, to change a support obligation, for countless reasons. It's important for the court to be able to determine what was intended at the time the agreement was entered, or even the time the court order was entered. You know, it's kind of like a snapshot of history taken at the moment of your settlement so that anytime there's a future application, both the parties and the court have something to refer to and to guide them. All right, so let's take a look at the actual documents. Um, I'm not sure if, again, I know many of you have case with information statements involved. Some of you haven't, um, but I'm going to walk through a form document. I'm going to try to, um, Make some notes in here with this little pen part. I've never used it before, so bear with me if, if I'm not the most accurate in it. Um, now, some just general comments about your case information statement. Um, because it is very important, but many of you will be providing this information to an attorney to compile. But what's important to realize is that lawyers aren't mind readers. If the information is not in the case information statement, we don't know it. We sometimes don't know what's missing. Now, fortunately, if you deal with attorneys that are well-versed in these areas or that concentrate in these areas, we will usually be able to pick up where something might be off. But it's hard to do, and it's not really our responsibility. It's not our position to tell you what to put in your case information statement. So it's really important that 
uh, it be done thoroughly and accurately. All right, so let's take a, a quick look at it. First part is part A right here. This asks for the basic information. This is where I was saying before, it gives sort of a history of the parties. Gives you the date of the divorce or domestic partnership, dates of prior statements. This means prior statements means prior case information statements. Your birthday, the other person's birthday, date of separation, date of complaint. This is important. Don't overlook it um, because sometimes the courts need these dates, especially if you're talking into uh, any kind of future applications. Now, over here, you have issues in dispute. Now, most people will just check off, you know, your basic cause of action custody. These are all your basic things. If you have, like, for instance, a divorce, you probably check most of these um, council fees. What's important is other issues. You need to take a moment and figure out if there are any other issues than your normal custody, parenting time, support and equitable distribution, like college, for instance, um, imputed income, if one of the parties is underemployed. In some cases, if you do not put a check that there's other issues, you may be barred from raising these issues at any time during the case. So you really want to take your time and make sure to consider everything that's going to go into this part A section. It's no less important than everything else. The next you see name and address of the parties, uh, relatively simple. One thing to watch, or not watch for, but just remember, they ask for children from other relationships too. Oh, sorry about that. Um, if you have a partner that has children with or from another relationship, you should still put this information in here. These are little bits that are going to be important to um, a judge or even to the other party or lawyers involved in the case when they're reviewing this. All right, going here to part B, miscellaneous information. Um, again, as I said, I'm going to give you points to when you fill out, but also things to be looking for. This section is more important when you have either yourself, but more importantly, another party who's self-employed. You want to look to see if they have insurances that provided through their employment or business and what the name is. If somebody's self-employed, it's often important to know the name of the company because you may need to run a state search, a statewide search to find out where the company is actually doing business, what kind of company it is. People will sometimes downplay the nature of their business. So you want to be able to search and see if they're being accurate and honest with what, what their name is. And you want to keep an eye on this for future changes. Like if, if, if your adversary is self-employed and they follow a future case information statement, you want to make sure that this doesn't change. If they previously had insurance and then you see that it's gone, it's really something you need to jump on quickly and you don't want to miss it. Moving down to part C, which is your income information. Now, again, this part is pretty obvious of what you need to fill in. The things that I usually recommend that you watch for first is right here where it says the year 2013. Now this number is usually put in by the person preparing. Now I say that because we prepare it on a, a, um, computer program. So we can choose what year to put in. I think the default when you open it up will be 2013 for this year because we're in 2014. Or I'm sorry, it'll be 2013 as a default when you open in 2014. So I was going to be one year behind. But you want to watch for if this has changed. If somebody puts in 2012 and you're in 2014, you have to stop and wonder why. Are they trying to use an income that may be lower or more favorable to them because there's no reason not to. It could be that they're simply unaware of what their current income is, but there are ways to address that. So that's going to be a red flag you want to look for is whether or not they've altered that year for any reason. Next thing to keep an eye on for is right here. It's where it says attach a statement of fringe benefits of employment. There's a part that we'll cover later where you're supposed to indicate whether or not you receive uh, perks or cash distributions or anything that's um, cash or non-cash supplemental compensation. But more often than not, people who do receive that kind of compensation do not attach it. First, you want to call them on it and demand that they do attach it. 
and you want to bring it to the court's attention because it's going to be important when determining income. And if they're not attached, which they commonly are not, it could be partly because they don't want the other side to see that they receive perks and certain benefits that are considered income that may not be reflected on a tax return or a pay stub. Again, here also, one over here, it says attach all full and complete copies of the last year's tax returns, W-2s, 1099, Schedule Cs, etc. Basically, it's saying all documentation that evidences the income that's being set forth in here. Again, now, if the information is being put in here, there's no reason why it's not being attached. If it's not being attached, it's a red flag, and you want to demand that they provide it. That you can even say to the court that the court shouldn't accept it until it's complete with the attachments that are required. Moving on to the section here, to present earned income and expenses, and as for average gross weekly income. This you want to verify and also make sure to see whether or not they're using past or future anticipated income. Um, <coughs> and it says attach pay stubs. So again, you want to make sure that the pay stubs are being attached. You always want to make sure that whatever is being set forth in here is accurate and matches with the documentation that they're supposed to be attaching. <coughs> now down here also another thing you want to check out for in part two deductions per week. One, you want to see if they check anything other. But what you want to do is when they do have deductions, both set forth in the case information statement or on their pay stub, you need to find out and you need to ask, if these are mandatory deductions or not. Mandatory deductions will reduce the person's income for child support purposes and possibly even alimony. Non-mandatory will not, so it's an important distinction to get a hold of. All right, so the next page, your current year-to-date earned income. Now again, for the people filling this out, it's usually pretty clear um, and again, if you're using an attorney or a program, um, you're going to type all this information and it calculates the number of weeks and things like that accurately for you. What you want to look for, again, is what's the other side doing? For instance, the from and to dates and the number of weeks. If they're filing a case information statement in December, and they're using pay stubs that end in October, it's a red flag. Um, many people will get year-end bonuses. <clears throat> many people will sometimes pick up extra time because the holidays are approaching. Um, and, and in December, you have a greater sense of what your year-to-date income is going to be. So if they're using a different date, um, and basically it's the two date that's the most important. <clears throat> It's a, it's a red flag, and you want to go and find out why they're doing that. But I guess, actually, not just the two-day, but from also. They're giving you, like, a small caption of um, dates, like a one month or two months, and it's in December. Again, there's, there's reason to question it. Um, although you'll have their year-to-date income, usually with any pay stub, the fluctuations are important. You want to see what is missing. You want to see what monies they're able to earn. Possibly, if they have certain um, jumps in – income, but they're arguing that they need to reduce their support, then you, you may want to argue that in those certain months that they pay extra. Um, but you would need to know what their average income is over time in order to do that. <clears throat> now here on these tax deductions, again, you want to verify with the pay stubs attached that they are, in fact, the numbers that are reflected on the, the pay stubs, because these deductions will affect how support is done. Go down on to number four, other deductions. Here's what I was saying before. I always see if they're saying it's mandatory, these deductions, so they were noted here. You also want to check for life insurance um, to see if it's how much it's being paid for and if it matches the um, affidavit of insurance, which is a document that gets filed in most of your divorce cases. Um, also, in your 401ks, your pension plans, again, you know, obviously, there's not much to explain for people filling it out, but what you want to look for is do these numbers seem larger than normal? 
do the numbers that appear in the case information statement differ from different pay stubs earlier in the year, even if the pay stubs are accurate. Um, people are able to, in many cases, adjust their withholdings, and some will increase them so that their net take-home pay is less. So you really want to scrutinize these two um, adjustments or deductions to make sure that they're not inflating them in order to reduce their support obligations. And here, wage execution. This is usually if they have another child and they have another child support order or even an alimony order. It's just something to catch. If, if it is here, you want to get documentation from the court or, or a court order from that person that there's a wage execution for a reason. Um, some child support orders will reduce the person's income for other child support orders. So basically the, the first child in court gets more money. So you want to make sure that, um, that it's accurate and it's by a court order. And then last on number four, year-to-date gross unearned income. This is, as it says, unemployment, disability, Social Security. Obviously, um, you want to put in your information, but you want to see if the other party is making or receiving any kind of additional uh, income, interest incomes, rental incomes. That all needs to go here. And if you know that they are receiving it and it's not here, you need to address it to the court. All right, so the next page is additional information. Um, the important thing here is number six. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm not the best with this pen, but number six, do you receive cash distributions not otherwise listed here? Now, this causes a problem on both sides if there is cash. Let's, um, if you're making cash that's unreported, you're still required to disclose it here. Moreover, if you're the other party, like your spouse, knows that you're making this kind of money and you don't disclose it, then your credibility is going to be affected. The flip side of this is when you say that you're making cash that's not disclosed, you're admitting to the court that you've committed income tax evasion, which could trigger an audit or, or sanctions from the court. And it causes a lot of problems. But nonetheless, it's got to be here. Or you need to address with your lawyer and your other party, the spouse or whoever it is, how you're going to address that issue so that you can be honest and accurate, <clears throat> but not expose yourself to any future problems. And down here, number 16, explanation of other income. This is a great section to use. And there's another part, I think, later, which we'll talk about similar to this. This is where you want to put anything that you need to explain. Even if you think it might not be important, you put it in here. Anything you anticipate in the future, increases or decrease in your income or your expenses or the other party's income or expenses. Or if they previously, somebody did receive certain distributions or cash that they're not now, you can note that, that that they previously had received it so that it should be considered. You really can do just about anything you want in a section like this, and you really want to use it to your benefit um, because there's no limits to what you can include there for the court to consider. Okay. Part D, which will have schedules A, B, and C. There's schedule A, B, and C. This, these two pages are crucial. Um, they are probably the most important parts of your case information statement. They are probably the most difficult to complete, but they are the most important. You'll notice that it's asking for two things, your joint marital lifestyle, and your current lifestyle. Now here, this empty box section that goes all the way down, this is a section, and I'll probably talk about it a little more later too, for footnotes. Very important, as you're going through all of these expenses, your joint and your current, all these expenses for A, B, and C, the footnotes are the most valuable landscape on your case information statement because you're able to put any information in here that you need. Very important when we talk about either both in this webinar but also in your case, anticipated future changes. You know, let's say you're living at home with your spouse, so you have a mortgage payment here. But obviously you're not going to be living together after a divorce. So you're going to have rent, but you don't have it in the expense. So if it's not in the expense, it doesn't come out in the total here then it may not be considered. So you want to put a footnote 
and explain that you're going to have rent. You can even put what how much you anticipate the rent to be so that that footnote, that rent issue will be factored into the support issues. Now, the reason that this is so challenging, and it's pretty clear just from looking at it, is it's very difficult to say how much you spend on food each month and how much you spend on clothing each month. First of all, you have to estimate. You know, the, the case information statement, and I'll say this over and over again, needs to be accurate but does not need to be perfect. So take what is either the, your best estimate or your most recent few bills. If you're not sure what it is per month, try to get a 12-month total from either a bank statement or just a good estimate and you know divide that over 12 months so that you can get some decent idea of what the expenses are. You want to also, again, build in certain things that are not common or not commonly reoccurring, like your plumbing and electric. Now, you're sometimes going to have that, and you're sometimes not. But add it in, even if it's $10. You know, $10 here and $10 there and $10 over here is going to add up and make a significant difference in the support amount. So don't discard something because it's a small bill. Other charges here um, you want to look to. Uh, you know, typically in here, these will typically cover the majority of typical expenses, but sometimes people have installment contracts on uh, appliances. Sometimes they have like insurance contracts to, for the replacement value. Anything that you may have that doesn't fit into one of these exact categories, you want to list it here. Again, every couple of dollars is going to make a significant difference. Now, one thing to remember, going from here to here, unless you're living together after your, after while this case is being filed or while your case information statement is being filed, this expense would probably be higher than this expense. If you had a family of three and then one spouse moves out and you have a family of two, certain numbers are not going to change, like your rent or your mortgage, possibly even your utilities. But when you get into the Schedule C, the personal expenses, there should generally be a, a common sense reduction in the amount of the expenses if there's been a change in the number of people living in the house. Which brings us to this page, Schedule C, personal expenses. Again, one of the more important of the most important parts is your Schedule C when it comes to support obligations. Um, it can be painstaking to complete this, but you need to take as much time as you can, as much time as at least the court will give you to complete it accurately. And remember, if a lot of times issues will come up like, uh, where is this here? Domestic help, for instance. If you didn't have it, don't put it in. You know, some people will say, well, I wanted a cleaning lady or I need one now or I'm going to need one. So you put in, but if you're going to need one, then that, that goes into the footnotes, which are over here. It's my, my pane blocks my screen, so I can't see exactly where I'm pointing to, but um, you put the footnotes there. Don't put an expense in here if you didn't have it. Now, other expenses, do you really want to put in, again, with a, either a footnote or, or some kind of indication? You want to look to, if you have children, children's lessons, entertainment. You want to put in some thought into what your expenses really are. You may even want to make a list while you're doing your case information statement of what lessons are in, how much it costs, where you went for entertainment, both while you were married and now on your own. It'll help you throughout your case. It'll help you with discovery. It'll help your lawyer. So while you're doing this, make a list of whatever is being included in here so that you know exactly how the number came about. Um, and another thing that's important to remember, too, with your case information statement, which, again, is utilized for alimony and support, that having an accurate case information statement, especially Schedule C, I guess A and C mostly, um, can help a great deal when it comes to modifying child support. Most people just assume child support is a guideline issue, meaning you plug the numbers into the child support guidelines and it gives you a child support number. And, and that's accurate. Um, the law is that the child support guidelines are presumed to be accurate, meaning that if you put in incomes, it's presumed that that's what child support should be. But that's a presumption that can be rebutted. So if there is a substantial compelling reason to deviate from the guidelines, the courts can increase or decrease child support. And, and most people, and even most lawyers, don't really think about that. 
They just ex expect it to be the guidelines. But if you have an exceptional high rent or you have a tremendous amount of children's lessons, like for instance, that's a perfect example because the guidelines include extracurricular activities. So your child support award is supposed to pay for all the activities that your kids will be in. But quite honestly, when the guidelines were first created, this was probably back in the 70s, raising children was very different. Um, kids played outside and they played in groups and then, you know, in the streets. Now they have play dates and karate lessons and swim clubs. So the amount of lessons and, and costs that people incur for national hockey tournaments may not necessarily have existed in the same way when the guidelines were created. And that's a, a compelling reason to want to deviate from guidelines, even just by an agreement to recognize that the costs for lessons are not covered by child support adequately anymore. <clears throat> okay, moving on to part E, balance sheet of all family assets and liabilities. You'll see there's four main sections. You wanna know who owns the property by title. This is plaintiff, defendant, or joint if it's both of you. The date of purchase or acquisition and whether it's exempt the value and the date of valuation. What's important here is the exempt part. <clears throat> if you have premarital assets, even if it's partly premarital and partly marital, like you had a retire a pension before you got married, it's the same pension that you have now. You want to note in here, in this column, wherever you're going to be for the asset, that you're claiming some of it to be premarital. And I've never seen this happen. But it is possible that if you do not put it in there, one could argue that you lose that argument or that claim because the part, point of putting it in here is to put the other side on notice that you're making this claim. If they don't know you're making it, then you might not be able to because it's an unfair surprise. So always consider what should be exempt. If you have your lawyer, obviously you want to talk to your lawyer about it. Even if you don't have a lawyer, you may want to consult with one to find out if you're doing this case information segment on your own, which actually, as a side note, I guess I want to recommend to anybody, if you are representing yourself and completing a case information statement, it can't hurt you to try to get a consult with an attorney just to look over and see what you may be missing. Um, I don't know if a lot of them will do it. I usually don't, to be honest with you, but there may be some and certainly worth asking. One thing that is not in here which I think is important to remember, especially when you're considering the other side's assets, <clears throat> is something called a contingent asset. And you'll see over here there's a contingent liability, but not a contingent asset. A contingent asset is an asset that you or the other person has, but you can't ascertain the exact value of it yet. Like, let's say you, um, you have a tax refund coming, but you haven't filed your taxes yet, or your, your, your accountant's filed an extension, but there's going to be a, a refund. Well, that's, it's an asset that you don't know how much it's going to be. And it doesn't really fit into any of these categories. So you want to add a contingent asset, especially if you know your other party is supposed to get one. You want to certainly make it known that that asset is out there and subject to being included or distributed, depending on what your issue is. Now up here, data valuation, this is usually very difficult for people to get, um, like for real property and vehicles. Normally you want to just put the current month unless you have like an appraisal for real property. If you have like a, a CMA or a appraisal, then you put the actual date in. Um, you can go to Kelly Blue Book for this and then, and then just put the current date in. <clears throat> in here often pension plans, IRAs, businesses, you may not actually know what they're worth and you put in a, a TBD to be determined. And it's appropriate, but you want to make sure to go back later and fill that information in. And if you're on the other side of the case, <clears throat> you want to make sure to get that information from them later. On, turn to the next page, statement of liabilities. Really the same category you see, name of responsible party as opposed to title of property. Um, not considered an ED or certain liability value and the date. Um, no great surprises here. <clears throat> Why is being truthful and accurate on a case information statement important? First, because you always have to be truthful and accurate to the court. Um, 
But but most importantly, the case information statement, as I said, is I think one of the most crucial documents. It's going to be utilized and referred to most often through a case and may even be used for years and years to come. So when you grossly exaggerate your case information statement, not only does it kill your credibility at the onset of your case, but it, it allows the other party a powerful weapon to, to repeatedly rely on. I'll give you a personal anecdote. In my own divorce uh, many years ago, my ex-wife filed a case information statement where she indicated our expenses after taxes each month to be like $70,000. And we lived in a modest townhouse in Nutley. So it's obvious that we were not spending $800,000 of after-tax money on just personal expenses that she claimed she was spending even after I separated when it was clear she wasn't even getting that kind of money. So it destroyed her credibility, and I obviously relied on it every single time I went into court on any kind of issue. It sets the tone for litigation again, one, from a credibility standpoint, but also it puts you on notice of who you're dealing with. And the example I just gave you, obviously, was clear to me who I was dealing with. And when you see something like that, you know what you're dealing with. You're, you're dealing with a person that, that has no regard for, for truthfulness, that has no regard for uh, being amicable, and that's going to follow you probably throughout most of the case. It's appropriate for condentedly to support. And this I'm going to highlight. This is very, very important. Pendented late is a support, well, it's pendented late means it's Latin for while the matter is pending. It's typically referred to for a temporary support order, pendented late support. <clears throat> pendented late support orders are very, very significant in litigation because they often sway the balance of power in a case. If somebody files for temporary support and they get a very large support award for temporary support, they have little incentive to rush for settlement. Conversely, if they get a very low one, then they're sort of strapped for money and they're more pressured to do it. So once the court makes an order of support, it will greatly change how your litigation is handled. So if you go in with a case information statement that is grossly exaggerated with no credibility, your pendente lite award is going to be affected and it's going to last through the whole case because it generally doesn't get modified and you're going to suffer because of it. So it's certainly not any to any benefit to try to inflate your expenses um 450 settlement agreement side this is the rule that talks about how to vacate a settlement if you discover or if it is discovered that a case information statement was inaccurate there was not full disclosure that's one of the only reasons that you can vacate a divorce judgment in new jersey but if it's discovered it's significant and it can be an insignificant amount you know there could have been a, a, a stock plan that, that wasn't disclosed but if it wasn't disclosed and it clearly should have been and clearly the person knew about it, it raises the question of the slippery slope problem of, well, if they didn't disclose this, what else didn't they disclose? And my settlement was based on what was disclosed, so I might have changed it drastically had I known differently. And for enforcement, whenever you have an order and there's an enforcement issue, whether you're trying to enforce it or it's being enforced against you, if you've come through the court and you have credibility issues because of a case information statement, it, it makes it harder for you to argue that you are just simply having a tough time and you need the court to accommodate you. Let's say you have a support order that you can't meet. But if you were found to be a person who lies or grossly exaggerates or underestimates expenses, it's kind of like a false in one, false in all. And, and judges will tend not to believe you as much when you've seen the file documents, which are certified, as I told you when we first sat down to this, and then you're coming to the court asking for help. You're not likely to get it. Okay, what should and should not be included in a case information statement? Aside from what we already talked about as far as what you want to look for. First of all, remember that you have a continuing duty to update this. Um, at any time something changes in your case, you want to update it. Uh, your divorce may take a year or two, sometimes even three. Um, anytime you're going to court on a case management conference or a trial date, you should file an updated case information statement. Even if nothing has changed, then change the date and file it just so that the court knows that everything is the most accurate. You have a duty to preserve old case information statements, yours and the other person's. You will find, as I keep saying, that it's the most important document 
when you return to court years and years to come, you may have an infant child now and, you know, in 15, 18 years, you're going to be back in court over college. They're going to need these case information statements. It's going to be a very important part in determining future obligations, all types of different obligations. What should be should be thorough and complete as possible. <clears throat> as I said, it's got to be accurate, but not perfect. Um, summary of averages, and I underline averages here because, again, you want to put in an average. You can't get an exact amount, and things are going to fluctuate. You can't put high, you can't put low, but it's a summary so that your averages should be in there. If you can't get into an average, then again, use the footnotes. Footnotes are a very powerful tool in case information statements to explain the information, good and bad, um, anticipated changes, and uh, absent information. And you should also include evaluation dates and whether an asset or debt is marital. That goes to what we were talking about before when it speaks about the exempt assets. Very important to include that information. Continuing on the same topic, what should and should be uh, included in the case information statement. You want to do anything you can to include attachments, not just the tax returns and the 1099s and W-2s that, that are requested by the document, but uh, you can make a case information statement as thorough and voluminous as you want. And the, and the more you do, the better it is. You can and should consider attaching utility statements, uh, insurance documents, tax returns, um, credit card statements, anything that will support and show that the money or the numbers that you attach or include are accurate. Again, judges and lawyers aren't mind readers. They're not going to know if what you're saying is true or not. And certainly most parties are going to have the other side arguing that the expenses are too high and that they should be lowered so that their support obligations are lower. If you attach documents, there's no disputing that they are in fact accurate. Include reasonably foreseeable issues like increased expenses, like I said before, if you're going to move and have rent in the future, um, daycare, camp, extracurricular activities like we talked about, college within a reasonable period of time, moving expenses, if you need a new car, and this is very important, health and vehicle insurance, oops, sorry. One of the greatest expenses a spouse incurs when divorcing is new health insurance. Often many had employer based insurance and now they're going to be getting their own. <clears throat> Very important to contemplate and actually get information of what your costs are going to be. <clears throat> and if you can get a quote again, you want to attach it so that there's no dispute that this is what the need is going to be. Along with foreseeable, you want to contemplate substantial changes in circumstances like what's going to happen when the kids go into daycare or when they're out of daycare and into school. Um, Got to be accurate and honest. Again, don't overstate because it's going to hurt your credibility, but don't understate because it gives you a short PL award. It's, it's a very careful balance that you need to walk in your case information statement. When in doubt, get some advice or make a footnote and say, this is my best estimate to what I think I should be indicating, but it could be entirely different. Use annual expenses again. Use to get monthly averages, best to be as accurate as possible. If you can take 12 months of statements and add them up, divide them by 12, you're going to know exactly what it's, the cost is. And you can even attach those 12 statements. Don't be afraid of having your case information statement look like a phone book. The more information, the better. Now, I think we're running short onto or over the time limit, but I'm going to keep going. Hopefully, um, those that are here are able to stay with me. Uh, okay, so again, what should and should not be included? Your monthly expenses have to match your monthly net income. Now, that may seem like common sense, but you'd be surprised, especially when the, the needy spouse um, who is looking for a, a large support award will grossly inflate their expenses. You need to, to look carefully and make sure that the net take-home income equals relatively closely to your monthly expenses. Now, the reason why that would differ would be down here. If you get financial support from others, like your, your family gives you gifts, or you use credit cards, home equity loans, borrowed from your 401k, family gifts, these are reasons why 
your expenses might exceed your net income. And if that is the case, you should indicate this in a footnote or into the explanation of um, other circumstances because it's going to be a question that comes up right away and it's a credibility issue. How could you possibly have these expenses if you don't have this income? And, and you want to be able to explain it and you want it in the document so you don't have to stand in court and answer these questions. You want it to be clear in the document. Save all prior case information statements. Like I said, even the other parties, it will be necessary when you have future um, modification hearings. Don't count on the court to have them. I don't even know how long the courts keep these documents. If they do keep these documents for too long, I don't know how many years. You want to discuss unforeseeable events as well as the other events we talked about, changes in circumstances, changes in extracurricular and, and anything. Again, I'm going to say over and over again, you want to add into your footnotes any possible changes. And review available documentation. I know I've covered this a couple of times, but the better and more accurate it is, the better your case and your awards will be. Now here, these are a few cases. I'm not going to go through them at length. They're here just for your references, um, and I can send you this information. Basically, these are just cases where you can see the effect of a poorly created or inaccurate case information statement, what it leads to, both when it's accidental as well as when it's intentional. Um, I'll give you a minute if you want to write down these names. I can send you the citations later if you're interested in it. So let's just take a second in case anybody wants to write that down. Here is real quick our information. Uh, most of you probably have the email address because I think you would have received something in order to register. But if you want to jot down, if you have any questions, there's our phone number and office address. <clears throat> and then lastly, it's uh, time for questions. I don't see anything that was posted throughout the uh, webinar, but if you have questions now, feel free to put them up there. Uh, again, it's my understanding that the um, questions are not viewed. You can't see them by the other people, so you don't have to worry about any kind of um, confidentiality issue. So feel free to pop it. any questions. Like I said, I'll take as much time as I need to address anything. I'm not seeing any questions again. I, I do want to see if there's anything that might not be clear, anything anybody wants to know, feel free to ask me now. All right, then with that, I'm going to sign off. Uh, thank you for coming and uh, keep an eye out. I'll be emailing details of upcoming webinars. I do one each month, usually the last Thursday. Um, and hopefully I can help you with other webinars. Thanks and have a good night.